Welcome to the Financing Simplified Podcast with Anthony Venuto. If you're looking for answers to your financial questions, let Anthony and his network of friends and associates answer regular questions that regular people have about their money. Thanks for tuning in. It's time to start simplifying your finances. Welcome back to the Financing Simplified Podcast, where today I got the uh, privilege to have my brother Claudio back on. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, fixed variable mortgages that are happening right now, what we see happening in the current marketplace. I think it's important conversation, especially bringing someone in who's got their feet and ears to the ground. Cloud, once again, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome you back to the show. Obviously, no introduction needed, but I still want to have a little background. No, definitely. Man. Thanks for having me back on the podcast. Happy to be here. Uh, a lot has changed uh, recently since the last time I've been on the podcast. So again, I'm a mortgage broker by trade with in touch, uh, but my specialty is underwriting and compliance, uh, fulfilling the deals, knowing where to place them, packaging them up. And yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of all to it. So no better person to have this conversation, to really talk about what we see happening, uh, with clients, not as having those conversations outside, but what's actually happening right now. And as someone who's, you know, with their feet to the ground, what do you see happening? Are variable rate mortgages making a comeback? Definitely. I think the conversation has completely flipped. People are asking about the variable, especially since we're seeing fixed rates still, you know, lingering around the high 5%, unless you're looking at insured deals. But most of our clients, right, being on the conventional side, they're not looking to take the risk. They're like saying, okay, with the Bank of Canada kind of stating that the variable is going to decrease by the end of 2024 leading into 2025 people want that one year kind of buffer to say you know what why would i lock into a three year currently a five percent where there's a chance that i can get it maybe below the fours depending on the discount and everything so the conversation is back i think the there's positive stigma around the variable rate again i know during covid with uh, sorry af after covid uh, once the Bank, Bank of Canada made those increase, uh, increases in uh, the interest rate, um, people were scared, right? And I think now people are over that hump and coming back to the table asking for the variable oh, rate. Awesome. So just as a quick caveat, conventional mortgages are 30-year amortizations, you know, the 20% down where clients could be refinancing or restructuring. And I think you brought up a really good point. When you're looking at those variables, we haven't really seen too many heavy discounts on those variable rate um, Pricing, so prime being still 7.2% with most of the major banks. What what discounts are we seeing? What prime minus 30, 40? Yeah. And insured minus one. <laughs> right? I, yeah, exactly. On the insured side, definitely heavier on the discounts, but I don't want to give away too much because you know what? If you're working with a good broker who has good, uh, you know, a good uh, relationship, relationship. relationship with their BDMs, we're seeing, we are seeing, you know, variables at prime minus 60, yeah. prime minus 50. So those are good discounts, you know, you're coming into the into the 6%. What, what does that mean, prime minus such and such? So, uh -huh. <laughs> so currently the prime rate is 7.20, which is, you know, the, the, the prime lending rate set up by the bank, uh, by your lender. And the discount is what you receive off of that rate, right? So or when we say prime minus, it's always whatever the prime rate is minus your discount. So that would be like prime minus 50 is what, 6.7%. Exactly. Which right. which is, uh, would you say it's unattainable at this level? Would you say it's very, it has to come down at one point? I would say like back to the conversation that Claudia said, like we've been having this conversation with our clients as well. Like between, six, I think about it, you still have to think about it because 6.7 to 5.3, let's say, it's still a big gap. There's still that disparity between the two rates. It's huge. But for someone who's risk advert, or who's a little bit more on the risk side, who's saying, look, I'd rather have something that's going to change. And I, and I think this brings up an important conversation that we'll talk about is the types of variable rate mortgages. Definitely. Because a lot of times you might get a good discount, but you might be in one of those trigger rate static payment mortgages where your payments don't move. So you lock in at 6.7, that's your payment. It, it doesn't matter what happens to the Bank of Canada policy rate. Ah, so wait, 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 wait. So Claudio, if somebody came to you, would you say, look, if you're having anxiety, stress, frustration with this interest rate, just get a fix. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever done that to a client where they're getting way overwhelmed and you just say, stop, the option also is fixed? I, you know what? Like what we're seeing right now is definitely what's easier to qualify. Mm -hmm. Like I know the, con like, the conversation is still there about the variable, like people maybe want the variable. 
but you have this is still a big gap between what the current fixed rate is and then what the variable rate is at so you know when you're qualifying at let's say 5.30 plus the two percent it's bigger it's a it's a lot better than you know at 7.20 plus the two percent so that that gives people you know it weakens their purchasing power yeah every, like i said everyone everyone's situation is different if it's the people that you know they want to know their fixed cost they say we need to budget i think fixed is definitely on a for a budget friendly uh client it's definitely the way to go but you have to give those the clients the options right we have to put everything mm -hmm. out on the table mm -hmm. for them and say listen you know with the variable rate product you can lock in right so right now this is your rate do you want to hedge your bet against you know the bank of canada bringing rates down um, versus you know the fixed rates so they we're still seeing fluctuation in the bond yield right so they're creeping up they're creeping down they're not really stable to say that you know the fixed rates are going to stay where they are they might increase they might decrease we don't know mm -hmm. um so definitely i think it's case by case basis i know i say this a lot but we're we, you know is. we're customer we're customers driven right like we take each client differently and we take their situation and we we put it on the table for them right mm -hmm. we don't have cookie cutter deals we don't take one you know formula and apply it to everyone across the board um we're hands-on with our clients and that's yeah. that's I think the key difference. I think you're you're spot on. Like I mean, this is the this is the value. I believe the value proposition of working with a broker. We're not trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. We're trying to literally tell the client, look, these are all the options in front of you. Uh, ultimately, what we're assessing what type of client we're working with. It's it's no different than, you know, working with someone who's going through the learning to plan their investment for the futures, understanding their dreams, their goals, and their aspirations, exactly. and how can we get them to that point. Because ultimately, if that client is very conscientious about their payments and the volatility and the fluctuations, then maybe the variable rate mortgage product is not for you. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe you're selling that fixed rate product at a shorter term um, to allow them that flexibility. As we always say, you know, marry the price of the home, you date the rate. And I think another important conversation is ultimately how long they plan to stay in the home. Mm -hmm. Like, is it their starter home? Is it their forever home? Uh, because that ultimately helps them plan. And, and you brought up something about back when a lot of people had the stigma growing around the variable rate mortgage. And obviously, from our experience level, like we were always presenting our clients with the options. A lot of them were selecting the variable rate mortgage based on the deeper discount at the time, mm -hmm. not being fully aware of the potential for the risk side, yeah. which came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, you know, those who wrote it out might be saying, okay, you know, the, the, the end is near. We're starting to see things turn over. But it all comes back down to the type of mortgage that they have. Like you mentioned, it's 100% true. From a fixed, you can't go into a variable. From a variable rate mortgage, you can lock into a fixed. Yeah. So that gives clients a little bit more peace of mind. But ultimately, it's the penalty too, the three-month exit. It is a lot of things to consider on, on those products. But ultimately, I think right now we're seeing that qualification. So what are you seeing on the qualification and with some of our lenders right now? Yeah, no, it's... Uh on the qualification side, it's the, the fixed rates, definitely kind of the way to go. If you're looking for that max qualification, people saying this, like, this is the house I want. This is the price I want to pay for it. How do I get there? Right. And we tell them like, if you want a variable rate, it's not going to happen. This mm -hmm. is your, your, your purchasing power is lowered by this amount. So you would have to go fix. And we're advising against around the three year fix right now, because the volatility in the market, you're not going to place them in a five year fix because mm -hmm. at five point six. 5.4 percent anything can change and in five years you can't touch that mortgage mm -hmm. in a fixed rate right so there's no exit strategy for them and that's where it comes back to goal setting and figuring mm -hmm. out what the clients want because i feel like also the education is, has changed people now know the difference between a static payment on a mm -hmm. variable versus uh adjustable. adjustable which changes with the prime rate right so people are saying well i don't want a static payment i don't mm -hmm. want i want my payment to change i want to be the more of the, the the payment being structured towards principal rather than interest. And, you know, that's that's what we have to look at too now. So people are actually educating themselves a lot more than pre-pandemic where it was just pandemonium, right? Mm. Houses were selling for crazy amounts of money, multiple offers, max qualifications and stretching yourselves thin. And, you know, we placed clients in variable rate mortgages and have had to have, I've had to face the music on, you know, you put me in this product and it's just going back to the notes and saying, listen, you know, Mr. Client, you told me that 
in one or two years, we're looking to either expand their mm -hmm. family, look for a bigger home. How can I go and place you in a three-year fix when your one to two-year plan or is... Or a five-year fix, right? Yeah, or a five-year fix and say, if your plan is this, how can how can I sell you on this product, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the importance of having mm -hmm. the disclosure in these conversations. We're, we're presenting the client saying, look, at the time when you're making a decision, you, you're faced with that opportunity, right? Where you're saying, okay, uh, do I take the variable rate product? Like I have a, like, do we take the variable or not? And at the time, certain clients have said there was a deeper discount, that, that payment was much mm -hmm. smaller on the variable. And just making sure that the clients are aware, saying, look, you know, this is this is a static rate mortgage. Like I remember this and I, and I, and I, and I have this conversation only because it was an interesting time in our careers. And a lot of people will say that they they saw the writing on the wall. I call BS on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to a lot of people. The situation was we we're reaching out to some of our lenders at the 2021 point and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to see a lot more of these static payment variable mortgages come to light. Uh, we're selling them more, right? Because people want that type of product or they were just looking at the variable rate mortgage because at that time, nobody really talked about the trigger rate. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knew, hey, what is what happens if the Bank of Canada raises rates to a certain point and my mortgage now has to increase, right? Because we know we know certain banks lenders, yeah. it's adjustable. Hey, Mr. Client, if the Bank of Canada raises the rate, boom, your payment goes up. Yeah. If the Bank of Canada cuts rate, prime lending changes, your payments come down. But we were telling clients, look, if this is a static payment, your payment is fixed. That means more money goes towards principal than towards interest or vice versa. I remember reaching out to a lender. <laughs> And talking to them, I'm not going to say who the lender is, major bank, but looking at it going, what happens? And they're like, oh, Anth, nothing. Uh, we've never seen we've it never happen seen before. It happen. We've never we've never had a client or a situation where we've breached that trigger rate point. And I'm like, yeah, I understand that. But what happens, right? What's, what's the protocol, right? And I'm pretty sure that particular person would put their hand or foot in the mouth uh, <laughs> now. But ultimately, as I said, this is this was new territory for some. And ultimately, some of our clients were were locking in. They were making that change. But I always go back to that, that little window in 2020 when we were getting bombarded with calls saying, okay, what's happening? Uh, the market, clients were like, was, they were spooked and they were locking in. Some of the clients that were in variables pack mm -hmm. 2019, they were saying, oh, I think that something's going to happen. I'm like, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Put, put the brakes on. In situations like this, generally what history has shown us is that the Bank of Canada is going to have to cut rate to sp spur the economy. We have clients that locked in in 2020, then ultimately decided home prices went through the moon, mm -hmm. and now they wanted to get out of their mortgages and they were paying $30,000 or $27,000 penalties, as opposed to now they're paying twenty-seven dollars or $30,000 more maybe in their mortgage over the course of the last That's two true. years, but they have that flexibility to get out, you know, this is what we're seeing happening right now, but ultimately what's coming across your desk right now? Like what, if you had to say, what are, what are you looking at? Is there a lot of condos right now? Is it's more detached single family homes? What's, what's the private you, you conventional know, th right now? It's, it's a mix of everything. And I think a lot, which is unfortunate is we're seeing a lot of the pre con pre con sales mm -hmm. that are now starting to close people. You know, they registered, they got their occupancy in 2023. And now because of the backlog are finally getting, their final closing date. So we're seeing a lot of pre-construction sales, whether it be condos or, you know, townhouses or semi-detached homes. And I know we're going off topic, but we're struggling too with the values just because from what they bought it for on paper is not currently mm -hmm. what the, the values are being assessed at now, but it, it's a mix, right? And I think condos will always be uh, the barrier to entry now. I think it's the first starter home. And I think, people have to, you know, just take that and let that sink in. You know, people want their cake and they want to eat it too. And sometimes we have to be real with clients and say, listen, you know, I know you want a single detached home, you know, but you don't qualify for it. Or, you know what, start slow. Uh, start in a condo, work your way up. There's, there's a long-term game. The property uh, ladder. Yeah, exactly. Make your way up the ladder properly. And I, that's what we're coming across. And well, let me let me let me drop you guys with five of five questions that I have. Okay. Sure. As I was listening, I, I think this is these are vital times that need vital answers. Claudio, let's start with you. How do you ensure transparency and open communication with the clients throughout the mortgage process? Well, we always have to tell our clients, like, listen, like 
I'm taking, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting down, we're talking about your situation, your current, uh, financial situation, what, what your debts are, what you're looking to do. And we're just, we're having to tell them, we're having to be honest and like, listen, you're going to see rates out there that are this much, but you know, those are 25 year amortizations. You have to be with less than 20% down under you, a million uh, and qualifying a 25 year amortization. You're already struggling to qualify in a third year amortizations. Your ratio is already out. You have car loans, you know, you have debt that you're bringing into the application, Mr. Client. Like if we need to go, sometimes it's, it's not a no, it's just not right now. And mm. It's having those difficult conversations where I think people appreciate it more now because you're being real with them. You know, there's some people that are the, yeah, yeah, you can get this done, no problem. Then, you know, it comes to fruition. Oh, we have to go private or we have to go on the alternative side. When these clients have no reason or there's there should be no reason why they're taking a private mortgage or taking an alternative lender when it just has to take baby mm -hmm. steps. I know there's risk involved where you can be losing money on the purchase price. We're starting to see purchase prices creep back up as there's been, you know, a month over month growth in Toronto, GTA, Vaughn. But it's just having the conversation and being real with them. I want to add something to that because I think you're spot on with the conversation point. A lot of times I'm working with clients that were reaching out to the bank or uh, maybe not a seasoned broker agent on the mortgage side that they're just telling them, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is the answer would have should have been no or not right now because of the fact that they're looking at the, con they're conditioning that file to high heaven, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying, you got to do this, this, and that. And that's what we're saying to clients too is, yeah, you want to do this? You got to pay out this car. Take some of your down payment, put it towards paying off these debts. A lot of clients were looking for easy money or easy access uh, and I was sharing, I wanted to do a little post on this, but I had a client that went to the, went to someone, they issued a uh, mortgage via fraud with one of the major banks because of the fact that the client wanted to buy this home that was over a million dollars and they did not make the income. And now they had to take a second mortgage against the property to pay for the first mortgage. Wow. And they're calling us now saying, Anth, can you help us? And I'm like, we told you at the time no, you know, like this is just not going to work for you. Like you, you need to buy at a smaller price point and the writing's on the wall for these clients. It's like, you can either rent out the property, try to make payments, but you, you, you shouldn't have never had this mortgage to begin with. Yeah. And, 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 and with that, I'm going to stay with you, Anthony. I'm going to ask you when you have to navigate complex financial situations with your clients, what strategies do, do you employ to find the best solutions for your clients? I really think it comes down to being an open book with our clients. Tell me the story, like on our discovery calls, this is the opportunity for us to jot down the notes, really understand what- Sorry, the, what's discovery calls? A discovery call is literally when we set up an appointment with a client just to literally understand. They wanna go through the pre-approval process. It's not just, here's an application, send me your docs. It's let's have a conversation about what your goals are because yes, you wanna get pre-approved. You wanna know what your maximum qualification is. That's based on, a, a fixed box of document of income and supporting docs, but let's have an exterior conversation. What's your investments look like? What's your family like? Are you planning to start a family? Are you single married? When you plan to get these, uh, these next legs of this journey, uh, you know, completed, because that's going to help us guide, uh, the conversation and give our clients the best value. I think the, it's not just, as I said, we're not paper. I need a mortgage. Yeah. That's what we'll get you. But ultimately, it's it's listening to you. We're not just going to sit there and take eight minutes and, yeah, jot down some notes and here's your pre-approval. Let's explain the options that are in front of you and why we think these options are relevant. Remember, you can always say, always say it. You can bring a horse to the water. You can't make it drink. But the value that a broker will bring is looking outside that pre-approval at the long term, 5, 10, 15 years from now. Yeah. Beautiful. Not Claudio, to, Claudio, go ahead. Not to take a jab at the banks, but yeah, they're just fitting clients into a box and sometimes they're giving them unrealistic expectations. And why are they doing that? Because they, they can't do anything else. They have to they have to fit them within that box or they know the client's going to walk. So at the branch level, they're like, okay, we'll click this box. And you know, we see it on both sides. Sometimes they over promise and, you know, under deliver and clients are put into a situation where they they won't be able to close because it's conditioned through the wazoo, you know, they're running it through everything. Um, but then we're also seeing where the banks don't even take the time. Sometimes they have a good client that comes to their desk oh, man. and it's the client. And it's like, you know, we get, we get the referral, we pick up the file and it's just like, 
wait a minute, how 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 was how was this even declined? Like, you and know, credit's good. I, I need, I need to add something to that because <laughs> it's interestingly enough, I had a client that th this happened to me. So, uh, a good referral agent of ours, a good realtor that we work with, uh, sent us over a deal that the clients were existing one of these major banks. And the client did not want to deal with a broker. They're just because they had this stigma. And, I, and as I said, I get it. People have this misconception or this idea. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the bank, they put an application in the bank and their existing clients of the bank, they're looking to port their mortgage and figure out their options. Two weeks, two weeks that it took the branch to get in touch with the client. By the time they got in touch to us, we already had the pre-approval done. They had purchased, uh, we spoke to them on the Thursday, the Friday we got the documents, Saturday we set up a call, Sunday they bought. Okay, that's that's literally the chain of events that happened. And all of a sudden now the bank was like, oh, come come back to us and we'll help you out. And, I'm, and I said to them, I said, you know what? Ultimately it's their choice. Mm -hmm. They wanted to work with me. They saw the value because we were able to execute within a couple of days, which took two weeks. And I said to the client, I said, look, in this market right now, you're competing. You don't know if you spent $10,000 more because you lost out on a home two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So the efficiency, the bank, and, and ultimately the bank was not even giving them the same approval amount because they weren't looking at the documentation that we had in front of them. We know they had children. We added in the child tax benefit, uh, the CCB, to improve their ability. We also got them positioned on their port. So many different things. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you something, Claudio. Can you delve more into the intricacies of mortgage-backed securities and explain their impact on the financial market. Oh, uh, that's that, <laughs> that's a loaded. That's a one. that's a loaded question, and I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that one to to Ant because he's uh, yeah, he's that, that, got that, a more of an insight on, on, on mortgage-backed uh, securities. I really, I really want to simplify the process with like simplify that financing conversation. simplified. Financing simplified. Look, there's a lot of stuff that, as I said, I'm not. Mortgage-backed securities, we all saw the big short. We know what that sort of implies, you know, that you're you're taking these mortgages, they're bundling them up, and they're selling them off to huge investment corporations. So taking that into consideration, what happens with the insured mortgage, right? These are these insurable insured mortgages that are 25 years or less. Uh, you're putting a huge amount of money down or under 20%. The, the reason why these mortgages are generally offered a better rate is because the bank themselves doesn't have the responsibility i should say or the uh they don't own that mortgage it's mm -hmm. insured it the easiest way i put it is it leaves as a liability comes back as an asset okay which means they sell off that mortgage they get their money back they're able to reinvest it into new mortgages yeah. where a conventional mortgage where you have a 30 year it's over a million dollars they have to sort of keep that on their books the bank has to hold on to that mortgage they're solely responsible yeah. for underwriting it now, has there been times where the bank during COVID uh, bought up 30-year mortgages? Absolutely. Like, this was obviously something that happened. But the reason there's a difference is because who's uh, taking that mortgage? Is the, we, have, we have a whole group of lenders in our space that only specialize in, they, that's their bread and butter is insured mm -hmm. mortgages. So we're offering super competitive rates on those 25-year AMs, sub a million, less than 20%, or 20% more under a million, putting down a huge amount of money. There's so many different options, but ultimately pay now or pay later. This is what we tell our clients. The reason why there's a difference in the rate is because once that liability shifts to the bank, there's a premium, there's a premium. And so now with that premium and, and Claudio, you've watched the big short, right? Yes. Okay. And so have you, and so have I, and so has pretty much everyone else. Having if not, you should that, watch it. It's, it's essential because that was the 2008 mm -hmm. bubble. Yeah. What have we learned, Claudio? As, as mortgage brokers and realtors and basically anyone in the financial sector, what have we learned from that pivotal moment in history? I think there's a there's a lot to take away from, from that moment in time. I know it's mostly based out of the U.S., but I think, you know, looking over at the Canadian side, they, they put, you know, policies and, and practices into place to kind of not let that happen, which, you know, have to give them some sort of credit and they kind of done a pretty good job with that. And Explain that, that though. What do you mean some sort of credit? <laughs> I'm curious. Who, who, are we, who are we after? Because I think Canada handled it well. Yeah. No. Or, it, kind of. Maybe. Our government, uh, the government at the time, the Harper administration, yeah. did, did a good job at handling the financial crisis here in Canada. Um, could it have been worse? Much, it, much, it, much it, worse? It, it could have been worse, but this is a testament to 
Um, whether you love it or hate it is the big brother mentality here in Canada, heavily regulated banks. We only have a handful mm -hmm. of banks that are uh, the major culprits of, of lending, right? 86% of the business of the business mortgage business is held with the major banks. Right. Um, I think in and around the 80 mark. What about those individual mortgage brokers in the U S though, that they also fell victim or they were okay. You know, eh. well, this, this, this would be a whole different, no, yeah. this could be like an, <laughs> like a three hour episode, but ultimately the difference between for us, the U S 2008 great financial crisis in Canada versus U S is the subprime lending market. Mm -hmm. Um, the subprime lending market was these ninja loans, no income, no job, no, 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 nothing. And they were able to give away mortgages that that never happened in Canada, even though some people argue and say, oh, yeah, but we have private lenders that do this. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a small percentage. Mm -hmm. It's a very niche product. It's not like people are just like, go get a home on a private mortgage that's an adjustable. And yes, we had variable rate mortgages that are adjustable, but the client needed to qualify and was stress tested mm -hmm. against the higher rate. Whether they like it or not, whether they could afford the payments or not, ultimately is another conversation. But the banks here in Canada they just posted their quarter. The, they just posted their their, their profits. They're up billions of dollars. Yeah. They're putting money for provision and credit losses aside. Scotiabank, for example, I'm going to use Scotiabank because they're one of the ones that have adjustable rate mortgages. They don't have, I think RBC as well, actually. Uh, they don't have mortgages that negatively amortize or they didn't allow clients to go past 30 years mm -hmm. unless it was an extreme circumstance because they're, that was just their protocol. And... These banks here are regulated by OSFI. OSFI is putting pressure on the banks and, you know, RBC saying, okay, we need to, the clients need to adjust their payments. Then you have other lenders like CIBC or TD that are allowing these clients to go 90, 99, 100 years. Yeah. But even then the banks are accommodating. They're saying, okay, let's add it back to, let's add it back to the principal, the mortgage amount. And ultimately, yes, this could be a uh, situation, but ultimately the banks themselves are well capitalized they're able to hold on to their situation and i don't think we're going to see that collapse that we, we that we saw with some of the major institutions in in the u.s even, even with the lenders they get and correct me if i'm wrong we always had the stress test was nothing new when it was implemented on variable rate mortgages we we're always qualifying it mm -hmm. at the at the prime plus two percent fixed rates it was whatever the 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 contract rate was that's what you could qualify them so you know after 2008, bank, uh, you know, Canadian government puts these implications into into fruition, and you know we have the stress test, which you know helped a lot of Canadians uh, not live past their means. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I think if you're looking at it, um, just privatization in banks alone, it's a completely different uh, observation to look between Canada and the U.S. Like Canada adjusted, like all the banks adjusted after the OE mm. financial crisis in the regards to their lending criteria. It's a, I think we chopped it from 35. Like, I mean, as I said, like I, I, I but they off the to. top of my head, they had, is they, they had 35 year or 40 year amortizations. They cut it back to 30, 30 years, years yeah. but they 20, had to, because they saw what was coming if they didn't. It, I think it wasn't an eye, an eye opener. I yes. think it was an awakening to see what potentially could happen but, in Claude, do you think that there was no choice if they didn't make those those decisions then and there we would have also hit tough times i think osfi yeah osfi it's, it's yeah. osfi that really pushed that what is that uh the uh ontario oh my god the <laughs> office of the superintendent of financial institutions oh okay. boy okay so there i could the, ask you what that means but <laughs> it's it's just basically pure relig is the uh is like the leader of the uh okay. Osby. and i, I said the, the names is the, the the position the uh superintendent okay uh, is peter rutledge like these are the guys that he's obviously patting himself on the back for introducing the stress test like yeah. he's the guy that brought it uh i think that, if i'm not mistaken but realistically the thing the thing with the the banks is that you have to everyone has to understand who owns the property like the banks your mortgage your property is their collateral mm -hmm. okay gotcha think about that of course. for a second okay now you're buying with five percent down do you own the home or does the bank even if with 20 percent down who mm -hmm. really owns the home well think about it who owns the home well, who's got technically who's got the leverage well, te well technically claudio right you tell me well yeah, it's a, kind of a gray area, like where the homeowner obviously still owns a home in in, in not, light of not title. Really, though. Let's no, look at the, percent, look at the mean, percentage of who owns what. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, there's 
equity if you sell the property you're still walking with the money you're not you're okay. not you're not giving the bank the full amount of value of your home so you do have a stake in your home but uh, depending you on do. even if you're owing still just ten yeah. percent the bank still owns it well the bank owns the collateral the which collateral, means exactly. which means do the banks have an interest think about it if the banks own the collateral or the equity in your home, they're lending you based on that. Do you think they want prices to drop? No. You think they want to jeopardize their collateral? Of course. Of course. They so, don't want to go into a negative where. Do you think banks want to become <laughs> landlords and 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 you know, uh, rental uh, property management companies? No, they don't. So this is what I'm trying to say: is the banks themselves here as a monopoly, as opposed to anything else? I think the banks really want to drive these prices to remain at least static or increase and that's and that's what i'm saying the the, the banking system here is much much different than okay in the US. so and we're talking now the financial sector banks in a structured environment they have something very cookie cutter very structured they're not going to veer away from it unlike mortgage brokers mortgage brokers independent mortgage brokers you guys face this problem and I'm going to ask you a question now, and we'll start with you. Can you elaborate on your approach to structuring mortgage packages for clients with unique income sources and unconventional financial situations, which banks will say, uh-uh, I don't want to deal with that at all? Banks have a small window, and I think it's around 15% of their, portf of their mortgage book of business that can be a little bit more outside of the box okay so the banks have a, a little appetite for risk um what we call exceptions uh, capacity exceptions or where the ratios will go over the major banks have thresholds each bank has a different threshold depending on the income so what i, I believe you might be referring to is someone who's you know self-employed or someone that has a uh, different type of income not all the lenders will look at things the same but it's important for the broker to exercise and review all the options. For example, if a lender is self-employed, or sorry, if a client is self-employed and you're approaching a lender, are you looking at their financial statements? Are you looking, because most of these lenders, they have maybe business for self or BFS products that the client could fit into, or they have um, certain requirements for net worth, which means if you have a lot of money sitting around in an account, sloshing around, that you can get financing, right? Ultimately, there's the equity programs with some of our lenders. Then you have alternative space lenders that have options for clients that are self-employed. When we're structuring this with our client, we're asking the question on whether or not the client is comfortable with these options. The idea, I think behind your question too, is we have the options as brokers to look at your conventional tier one lenders, your alternative B space banks, as well as those private lenders, if, if, and when we need them. But that's what I mean. You guys have the freedom to explore options where banks have now dog, created. I just want, I want to add on that. I think it's, it's definitely, we have the freedom to go outside and use different lenders and, 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 and shop it around. You know, we take that application, that one credit bureau, and we can go through a wide variety of lenders that might fit that client's needs. But I think it's, it comes back to the importance as us as brokers to mm -hmm. know our lenders' policies, what their you know what their guidelines are. We can take net income after dividend, mm -hmm. add it to the application, which shows more income, and you're still within the A bank. You know. But now this is the financial sector that is limiting the mortgage brokers that are under a bank from going above and beyond. But you just took the words yeah. right out of my mouth. It's it's literally like when we worked for the banks, we both our entire brokerage pretty much a lot of us came from the bank is when you go to a bank you're sort of working with under their umbrella if they only have these products that they can offer you that's it like mm -hmm. they they can't think outside the boxes they're not taught really to think outside the box that person nothing against the banks as we came there and we use the banks but Generally, that person might be also opening up bank accounts and during our yeah. species and you know they're they're not like always concentrated on the mortgage industry so when you're working with someone who's a broker they they know that hey if it doesn't fit here it can fit there if it doesn't fit here or if we do this and this then we can make it work here we're we're trying to work with whatever we're given and this goes back to the conversation about if the client's open and forthcoming with you then we have different options we'll have clients that are maybe self-employed that come to us with very low income because there's a lot of expenses 
but they have a good amount of money sitting in net worth that they thought that, hey, the bank may not be able to qualify them. But by just having that extended conversation or looking at different options, you open up a door. So this is why it's always important to be transparent. Not only is the broker to be transparent with the client, but the client to be transparent with yeah. the broker. And the very last thing, because we're approaching the end of our episode, and I want to just talk about the current market as it stands today. When people are standing by their Instagrams and their TVs and their news and their radios and waiting for that report, waiting for that next step, can we shed some light on maybe people shouldn't take all of that so seriously? Let's t let's talk about that and why people need to be, I don't know. It seems to me that it's very aggressively being watched when it probably shouldn't. Yeah, I'll start this off. And I think, you know, we have to take away the negative out of it. I know some people look at it as a negative, like, oh, I'm not going to be able to buy a home. I'm not going to. I can't save this amount of down payment. The government's doing a number on us. And and definitely to some people's point, you know, there there there's situations where uh, the bank, let's say Bank of Canada or, you know, the government with the regulations have crippled, you know, first time home buyers and the younger generation. But, you know, we just have to, to let them know. And I think this is our job. And the whole reason behind the podcast is to bring that education forward to clients, let them be more aware of what's out there. You know, there's different options. Not everyone fits into a box. Mm -hmm. um, the news is not geared towards one type of people. They're just, you know, they're they're spreading news to an audience. Whoever's whoever's watching, whoever's standing by their phones or looking, living through their screens, mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna attract them in, whether it's positive or negative. So I think it's just step, take a step back. Mm -hmm. You know, always have an ear for it. It's not saying completely ignore it because it's good to stay in tune and, and, and see what's happening, especially with, you know, government, politics, and how it's going to affect you as a Canadian. Um, but, you know, just you know, take it with a grain of salt. I think social media is bringing a lot of information to the forefront, more so than we've ever seen in the past. More Canadians are living on the news of the bank of canada whether they're looking to buy or renew their mortgage whatever it is more canadians are paying close attention to the bank of canada now than they ever have like I, i've yeah. watched i've always watched the bank of canada press conferences and i see the viewership going from like a couple hundred to now several thousand mm -hmm. uh which means you're getting a lot more views more eyes on what the bank of canada says say ultimately at the end of the day the bank of canada is going to be very interesting for some because some people will just listen to what the bank of canada says and take it at face value but i always say it's what the bank of canada is saying and what they're not saying is what's going to yeah. drive the market people are going to interpret differently if you're an economist if you're a bank if you're someone who's looking at bond yields uh you know if you're an institutional investor you're going to look not only at the bank of canada you're look at the uh, u.s chair the federal reserve jerome powell you're going to look and dissect that the average person can't do that. The average person just says, oh, Bank of Canada held policy rate. What does it mean? But you know what it means to me as an outsider, not a mortgage broker? It means that there's stability coming. Because there, if they had dropped it, and then and then there's this uncertainty, well, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? The fact that they've now held. For, six is this, times. Six mm -hmm. times. This is the sixth time that they've held. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mind that. Actually, I like the stability behind it. Am I there's, wrong? There's a little stability. Well, There's a little yeah. stability. Here's the thing: the the the, the last the bank of Canada came out on uh, March sixth. Yeah, we won't say yeah. dates, but yeah. Uh, well, March sixth, they came out March sixth, twenty. I don't know when this episode's coming out. Okay. Well, no, I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying they oh, they, oh, oh. they did we're, the we're recent past, one. Yeah, most, yeah, most recent one. Even if this episode comes as long as before April. Yes. Um, they they came out shorter conference. We were listening to it in the car with my brother. And ultimately, what information are they really telling you? They're holding they're holding the rate steady. The governing council has decided that it really isn't the time for them to cut rates. And I believe that to be true. I don't think the Bank of Canada should be cutting rates. And many people are saying, yeah, well, we want rates to drop. And I'm like, yes, but on what at what well, consequence? What's the consequence? Right? If the housing market is reigniting and we have a federal government that's gonna start spending, you know, billions of dollars. You know, we have to fight the inflationary pressures that are happening there, right? So the Bank of Canada has to play very close. But ultimately, I think th there's a lot of confusion. I think the Bank of Canada creates confusion uh, because they're not going to give forward guidance on their forward guidance. Like, they're not going to come out tomorrow and say, we're cutting rates in September. 
What's that going to do to the market? Imagine if they came look, out look, and said that. Look what they did in the during the pandemic. We're going to keep rates where they are for foreseeable future. But the, what did that cause? But the right. pandemic was something entirely different. Yes, but yes, it's lots still, of lies, you know, lots of deceit, lots of weirdness. But you know what? Like like my brother said, there was a lot more. There's I feel like there's probably a lot less people paying attention to the Bank of Canada update uh, leading up to that point during COVID, and then you know the Bank of Canada says that statement. You know, giving people a little bit of confidence. Going out to spend and, you know, we're in this situation now, not that I'm blaming 100% of the Tiff Maglum and Bank of Canada, but when you come out with such a bold statement and say, we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future, you're telling Canadians something. And now I think they learned their lesson because they're not going to come on and say, oh, we're going to like, we're not going to, we're going to cut rates in starting September. They, they've learned their lesson. I feel like they're not going to make those type of statements anymore. No, nope. I agree. I think rates have to stay where they are right now because of just not igniting the Canadian housing uh, economy again um, and going back to, you know, un, unseen numbers of house values and multiple offers and, and prices and the markets being driven back up again. Um, we need that little bit of stability right now and they're tackling inflation and... It is what it is. I want to. I want to pose this question: If the amount of viewers to the Bank of Canada are today, so let's say, for example, in 2024, the amount of eyes that are on the Bank of Canada every time they come out with a press release. Remember, now in 2024, every single time, every one of those eight times that they come out, there's a press conference to follow, where that wasn't the case in the past. Yeah. So imagine if back in 2020. When the Bank of Canada made that statement, if the amount of viewership was as of today back then, the market would have ignited almost instantly. Instant, because at that time it took time for people to be like, okay, Bank of Canada is cutting. They're going to hold. Okay, slowly, slowly. What does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Now today, right? Correct me if I'm wrong or you think I'm, I'm out to lunch, but if the Bank of Canada was to come out with a we're going to be cutting rates mentality, it would instantaneously ignite the market there's no i believe there's 100 mm -hmm. unfortunately whether you like it or not people are going to base their buying decisions their moving decisions now on what the bank of canada is doing more people are and tuned in to add that i think going back to the case of you know standing by their phones i think people are waiting for that they're like now's goal Bank of canada is saying you know they're going to cut rates this is goal time let's Get the, let's get everything started again. Let's go buy a house. Let's get a pre-approval. Get everything started. People They're are waiting. Running. They're just waiting. And I think people are waiting now where they can find you. <laughs> that is the biggest wait of them all. And so well, as we round that. out that conversation, obviously, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at uh, In Touch Mortgage Solutions. Visit the website. Uh, Claudio is a uh, phantom where, on where, Instagram. Where are you, Claudio? What's your Instagram? Well, at no, home. We, we, the office. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the uh, In Touch uh, Instagram account where you know you can I definitely didn't. direct message us or you know our email and everything. And on, you're, you're going to be respond, responding on that, right? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So our Instagram at In Touch Mortgages. You can reach me or uh, follow us at a underscore venuto you know we have our youtube channel as well as uh, we're on uh, spotify spotify you know youtube so we uh, thank you all for your viewership thanks again claudia for coming out having thanks this wonderful conversation me. and uh, we'll see you next time